Welcome to Studies in the Book of Revelation. I am so delighted that you've joined us tonight. The Book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and we're studying it chapter by chapter, going over the verses together. This is an in-depth Bible study on the Bible's last book to prepare a people in the last generation for the coming of Jesus. The book of Revelation begins with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it unto his servants by his angel John, by, by his angel to, to his servant John. Blessed is he who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, who reads the prophecy and who keeps the things therein. You know, there are many people that feel the book of Revelation is too difficult. It just can't be understood. But yet it is a revelation. Now, the word revelation itself means an unveiling. It means an, a revealing, something that God unfolds to us. So the book of Revelation is a revealing of God's plan in history. It's a revealing of what's going on behind the scenes in the cosmic conflict between good and evil. It is a revelation of God's plan to defeat Satan and triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. Now, remember last week we said that revelation could be uh, summarized in four words. Jesus wins, Satan loses. A couple of things we asked about, we asked last week. Uh, we said, if you have any questions, send them in. And I do have a, a few questions that have come in. And so I'll begin by answering those questions. And if you have any questions, you can send them to Hope Lives 365.com. That's info. So put info at Hope Lives 365.com. Once again, to be sure you have it. Any questions, info at hopelives365.com. When you um, write your questions in or send them in to our website, then the next week, the following week, I'll answer them. So here are a few questions from last week. Uh, Pastor Mark, uh, in Revelation 1-4, it talks about the seven spirits. Who are the seven spirits? In the book of Revelation, numbers are significant. The number three in Revelation indicates the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then you have the counterfeit Godhead, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That's three. Number four in the book of Revelation indicates uh, universality, the four winds. That's north, south, east, west, universality. 12 in the book of Revelation indicates completeness. For example, the 12 tribes of the Old Testament represent the complete Old Testament believers. 12, patri 12 uh, apostles represent the 12, uh, represent all of the New Testament believers. So 12 is, is a significant number as well. Seven is a real very important number. You have seven seals, seven churches we'll study tonight, seven trumpets, seven branch candlestick. You have the seventh day of the week, the seventh day Sabbath. So seven is a significant number, indicates perfection. So seven spirits are not introducing an individual spirit, but the perf perfect work of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know that? Because that very verse, and let me look at it with you, Revelation 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. Who is, was, and is to come. That's obviously God the Father. From the seven spirits, leave that for a moment, who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So you have the Father, the Son, and the perfect work of the Holy Spirit. Now, why does it give you the number seven there? We do get a little insight into that in the book of Isaiah. So if you have your Bible, go back to the book of Isaiah. You're going to look at that in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. All the Bible and the books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. So 
you're looking at Isaiah 11, verse 2. There are 404 quotes from the Old Testament in Revelation. So notice the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? He's the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll testify of me. So it's the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus' personal witness on earth that testifies of him. That's one work of the Holy Spirit, testifies of Jesus. Shall rest upon the Spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom in the decision-making process as we seek God. The Spirit of understanding. The Holy Spirit gives us deep understanding as we study the Word of God. It's only as we have the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and minds that we can understand the Word. The Spirit of counsel. The Holy Spirit gives us counsel on right and wrong. The Spirit of might. Might has power. The Holy Spirit gives us power to transform our lives. The Spirit of knowledge. The Holy Spirit is the source of knowledge. Remember, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the knowledge of the eternal in the Bible comes by the Holy Spirit and the fear of the Lord. That is respect for God that leads to obedience. Notice those seven things. Spirit of the Lord, one. Wisdom, two. Understanding, three. Counsel, four. Might, five. Knowledge, six. Fear of the Lord, seven. So when Revelation used the expression, the seven spirits, it's talking about the complete, perfect work of the Holy Spirit that works in the heart of the believer. Let's look at a couple other questions. Uh, Pastor Mark, um, how long will this class continue? Well, there are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. And um, if I'm speeding along, we might get through a chapter a week and do 22 weeks. But, you know, sometimes these chapters are so comprehensive that um, it's going to require more than a week. Now, it might be that I got on a speed racetrack and we go through a couple chapters a night, but that's kind of doubtful. So my guess is, and don't hold me to this, please, but my guess is that we'll do 24, 25 weeks to get through the entire course. Stay with us. If you have to miss a Wednesday evening, we are archiving them for you to go back to. Uh, somebody asks, I would really like the handouts. How can I get them? We don't post the handouts before the class. We post them after. Because once I teach the class, then you can take notes, and then you can look at the handouts after. So I'm going to give you a website to go to if you want to get the handouts. If you want the handouts, go to hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. Hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. Here's another question that came in. This will be the last one we'll do for tonight. It says, who are the 24 elders mentioned there in Revelation 1? The 24 elders. Let me tell you what I think about that. We know that these 24 elders, at least the evidence is that they are the redeemed from the earth. You remember in Matthew chapter 27, it talks about Christ dying. And then when Christ died, the graves were opened. And then Matthew 27 says, when he came out of the grave. Well, let me just read that for you so that you can see it clearly. No, it's the word of God and not my word. Matthew chapter 27, we're looking there at verse uh, 51, 52, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, the graves were opened, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection. So the graves were opened when Christ died, when that veil was split in two. But these bodies didn't come out of the graves until after the resurrection. Who were they? Righteous believers down through the centuries. In Ephesians 4, it says, when Christ descended on high, he led captivity captive. That was death, he led captivity. And he led a host of captives. So who are the 24 elders? They are part of the honor convoy that ascended to heaven with Jesus after his death and resurrection as the first fruits of those that will be resurrected from the dead when Christ comes the second time. You remember Revelation? Of 1 Thessalonians 4 says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven, verse 16 and 17, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So who are the 24 elders? 
men and women, I believe, redeemed from the earth. You and I can look up into heaven and see that men and women, just like you, just like me, have been ascended to heaven with Christ. They faced the temptations, but through Jesus, they were overcomers. And that's what we want to study about tonight. So I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray and go right into our Bible study on the book of Revelation. We are going to be studying Revelation chapter 2, begin our study of the seven churches tonight. So let's pray. Father in heaven, grant us insight from your word, but may the practical truths of your word burn their way into our hearts and minds so our lives are transformed. We want not simply our heads to be filled with knowledge, but our hearts to be changed and our lives to be more like you. In Christ's name, amen. When we study the book of Revelation, chapter 1 introduces to us the living Christ, the Christ that gave us his word, the Christ that is the embodiment of his word, the Christ that died for us, the Christ that lives for us. He is our dying Lord. He is our living priest. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye will see him. He's the coming king. So the book of Revelation reveals the controversy between good and evil down through the centuries. The first 11 chapters deal with the seven churches, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets. Now, there are some interludes in there. You have chapter 4 and 5 that talks about Christ as creator and Christ redeemer. Chapter 10 talks about the rise of God's end time people. But inter faced all through that, interspaced all through it. You have the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. Now, John gives you a prophetic key that's absolutely critical to understand Revelation. And you find that prophetic key. What are keys for? What are keys for? Keys are for unlocking doors, right? So with this key is to unlock the mystery of prophecy. Here it is, Re Revelation 1, verse 19. The angel says to John, now when an angel tells you to do something, it must be pretty important, right? Revelation 119, write the things which you have seen, past tense. John, these are the things I've showed you. And the things which are present tense, the things that are going on in your day, John, and the things which will take place after this. So when you look at the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, they reveal things that have taken place in the past, things that are currently taking place in the present, and things that will take place in the future. When you look at the seven churches, and we'll study the first four of those tonight, these seven churches were literal churches in John's day. They were actually arranged in almost like a, a circular postal route. You've got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. So they, they, the messages to these seven churches deal with spiritual conditions in each church, and these were real churches that existed in John's day. But here is the magnificent thing, a couple things. One, these churches also represent general periods of time from John's day to our day. But there's a third thing. The conditions of these churches are present today, every single one of them. And they reveal in seven vignettes how God's people, in whatever circumstance they find themselves in, can overcome. So let's just jump right into the seven churches. Look at their historical periods and get insight from them and then see how they apply to our lives. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. Well, let's pause there. Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus? Is there a book in the Bible that was written to the church at Ephesus? What's it called? You know it. Ephesians. Paul visited Ephesus in 52 AD. He planted the gospel seed there. Ephesus was a seaport city in Asia Minor. It's actually in Turkey today. It was also on a trade route from Syria. Ephesus was a magnificent city. It was one of the capitals of the Roman Empire. 
It was lavish with goods, filled with trade. There was a large temple to Diana or Artemis there. Um, Paul spent time in 52 AD, 54 AD there, 52 AD rather, I'm sorry. And then 12 years later in 64, he came back and spent uh, more time there. In fact, on one occasion, Paul spent three years in Ephesus, more time than he spent in any other city. So Ephesus was a very strongly spiritual city. It had a very strong Christian community, but it faced some very challenging times there. Because when John is writing, he's writing in about 96 AD. So that's at least 30 years, 32 years to be exact, after Paul's last visit. And the spiritual condition as time went on began to change. So let's go to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden seven golden candlesticks. So notice Jesus holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now, we already learned in Revelation 1 that the stars, it said, were angels. But wait a minute. The word angels is angelos, messengers. And many translations say church leaders. So what is this saying? It's saying, if you're a pastor, if you're an elder, if you're any church leader, God's got you. He's holding you in his hands when you face the trials of life. Now, notice what it says. He walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So who are the last seven golden lampstands? Well, we read in Revelation chapter 1. Look, last verse, Revelation 1. The seven stars are the angels. And if you have a little asterisk there, I have a little four in my Bible, a little asterisk. It'll say angels or messengers. So the seven stars are the seven messengers or the leaders, the pastors, the elders of the churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven what? Churches. Where is Jesus pictured here? Is he pictured on his throne in some high and holy place? Not at all. Jesus is pictured in the midst of his church, in the midst of his people, whatever church you attend tonight. As a faithful Christian, you can have the sense that God is in the midst of his people. God holds his church in his hands, his leaders in his hands. God is, walks among us in Christ through the Holy Spirit, touching our hearts, giving us hope, giving us encouragement. We are not left alone, but we continue. Jesus speaks. Now, you'll notice this expression to each of the seven churches. He always starts with, I know thy works. I know thy works. So, Jesus knows all about us. He knew about the church in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. Jesus says, I know your works. You'll notice every time he starts with that, I know your works. Nothing can be hid from God. There's nothing secret or that's unrevealed to him. I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. The church at Ephesus, the New Testament Christian church, worked tirelessly for Christ. You see the word labor there? It's an interesting word in New Testament Greek language. It means labor to the point of exhaustion. So the problem with Ephesus was not in any way that Ephesus was a slacking, lazy, complacent church that didn't do anything. No, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those that are evil. So here's a church that's a missionary church, a church that's doctrinally pure, a church that um, defends the faith, a church that holds up the biblical standards. That's something to be complimented about by the living Christ, isn't it? Oh, I pray to God today that in your congregation, wherever you are, that your church will hold up the biblical standards and not be shaped by the culture around it this sex-centered, morally twisted, and de devious society, this uh, pleasure-mad, pleasure-crazed society. God says, no, I know your works, your patience. You've toiled to the point of exhaustion. You can't bear those who are evil. Notice, and you have tested those who say they're apostles. So some, that they've tested the ones who, who are claiming falsely to be apostles. 
and are not. You found them liars. You've persevered and have patience. You've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So what picture do we get of Ephesus so far? An active church, a church that is witnessing for Christ, a church that is tireless in its labor for Jesus, a church that's reaching out to its community, a church that's defending the faith, and a church that has doctrinal integrity and purity. But he says, verse 4, don't you wish it would have stopped there? Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What was Ephesus' problem? It substituted duty for devotion. It labored for Christ. It tried to defend the faith, but its prayer life was weak. Its devotional life was weak. The very heart of spirituality was eaten out. And Ephesus went through the formal ritual of religion without a deep heart experience with Christ. And the living Christ had not transformed their lives. Nevertheless, I've Somewhat against you because you've left your first love. What happens when you leave your first love? And how can you and I be certain that we'll never leave our first love? He gives us three things right here in the text. Remember, therefore, from when you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. The f- three R's. Remember, repent, and where it says do the first works, that's return. So let's unpack that for a little while. How can you and I keep from losing that passion for Christ, that first love experience for Christ? First, we remember. Remember those days that we had precious experiences with Jesus. Remember what it was like when you first came to Jesus. Remember the joy you had in prayer. Remember the joy you had in opening the Bible. Remember the joy you had in reading books like Desire of Ages and Steps to Christ and Thoughts from Mount of Blessing. So, so if you if you if if Christianity, if your love for Christ is waning, if you find your first love slipping through your fingers like grains of sand, remember. Remember the preciousness that it was when you first came to Jesus. Then the next point he says is what? Remember. Therefore, where you've fallen, repent. If you find you have a formal Christian experience, get on your knees and cry out to God and repent. Say, God, I'm so sorry for what I've done. Lord, I've substituted duty for devotion. I've substituted my work for you for a relationship with you. God, please forgive me for that. And notice what it says, repent and do the first work, return. Return to the first work. What's the first work? The most important thing in our life is knowing Christ. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Set your affections not on things on earth, but on things above. So here, um, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when it says return to the first works, place priority on the things that count. Place priority on the things of eternity. Don't even allow your work for God to substitute for your relationship with God. We can never, we can work without being, but we cannot be without working. What God is emphasizing to the church at Ephesus and to you and me here is the importance of being, who we are before Christ, our characters formed in the image of Christ. But then he goes on, he says, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Was there a lampstand in its place? Could a lampstand be removed if it wasn't there? Not at all. This is a powerful text indicating that you can have salvation, but you can lose it. There's no such thing in the Bible as once saved, always saved. Your lampstand can be removed, and if that lampstand is removed, you're no longer saved, but you're lost. 
So God is saying to you, guard your Christian experience and your relationship with Christ with everything you have. Then he says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans that I also hate. Nicolaitans, who were they? What did they teach? Now, there is some evidence. You remember in Acts chapter 6, it names the seven deacons. One of them was Nicholas. And there is some evidence that this Nicholas, that was one of the seven deacons, drifted away from Christ. We can't be 100% sure if it was this Nicholas, but we do know about the Nicolaitans. Now, how do we know about them? Because when you go back to the early church fathers, like Irenaeus, for example, and, and you go back to these early church fathers, you can go back and you can read second century accounts about the Nicolaitans. What did they believe? They believe in unbridled passion. They believed that it was unnecessary to be governed by things outside of yourself. They believed that the mind was a sufficient guide for your behavior. They also rejected the concept of obedience to the law of God. So they practiced sexual immorality. They offered food to idols. They, they lived lives of unbridled passion. What's the folly of the Nicolaitans today? It's, it's the idea, well, you just love Jesus and do whatever you please. Obedience is totally unnecessary. You know, you can, you can really live like you want. It's a superficial Christianity. Then notice what scripture says. Right after this passage that says, this you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So what are the Nicolaitans, if I could summarize it this way, the Nicolaitans have a human form of religion in which they allow the culture of the world to shape who they are. And what does it say in the next verse? He that has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here, John says, don't allow yourself to be shaped by the human culture because I have something far better for you. I have something far greater for you. Let your mind be shaped by the word of God. Let the living Christ fill your life. And as he does, one day you will eat of the tree of life. One day you will sit by the water of life and drink of the water of life. One day you will be in the midst of the paradise of God. Do not allow this world to shape your mind, your thinking, but let it be shaped by the word of God. Let it be shaped by the living Christ. Never let anything also even work for God. Destroy your relationship with God. Place priority on being God's man, on being God's woman, and let God work through you to accomplish his work. Now, the church at Ephesus was the first century church from about 31 AD after Christ died to just at 100 AD. The scene changes and we come to the second church, Revelation 2, verse 8. And, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna write. Now, the word Smyrna most likely means sweet-smelling incense. It's very interesting. There was an, um, an aromatic herb called muron that was used for embalming for death. The church at Smyrna faced persecution. The church at Smyrna faced death. And isn't it fascinating that the name Smyrna reads sweet smelling incense? Where is Smyrna today? Uh, Smyrna is the modern city in Turkey of Izmir. It's a seaport city, beautiful, beautiful city today. But it's amazing because the ruins of the ancient city are still there. Uh, the city of Smyrna was, again, a very famous Roman city, a Roman capital. Uh, let's read about it. And there's no condemnation here to the people of Smyrna. It says, verse 9, I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. I know your works, faithful to Christ, your tribulation, you've gone through trials, your poverty. It's a poverty-stricken church. Christians in this society of Smyrna were poverty-stricken. We'll tell you why shortly. But you are rich. Rich in what? Rich in faith. 
rich in commitment. Your life is filled with the word of God. I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. The blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is declaring one thing and being another. And so there are those who insist they say they're Jews and are not. Those who say they're followers of Christ and are not. Look, why not? But are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear anything that you are about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. We're going to look at all of this, but be faithful to death and I will give you a crown of life. Now let's go back and unpack that. The church at Smyrna would face terrible persecution. Do you see where it says that um, you'll face tribulation 10 days? The church at Smyrna largely was the church from 100 to 313 AD. The New Testament church in the Ephesus period grew rapidly. By the end of that period, 96 AD, they began to lose their first love. But the devil saw the church growing rapidly, so he came against it with fierce persecution. So you have the persecutions within that 100 AD period to 313, there were a number of Roman emperors who persecuted the church. Now, usually Christianity was not persecuted in the Roman Empire um, because they were Christians. The reason they were persecuted was because they would not burn incense to Caesar. In Smyrna, in the marketplace, you had three major gods. You had Aphrodite, the goddess of, of love and sexuality. You had Dionysus the god of uh, wine and revelry, and you had Demeter, the god of thunder or the elements. Once a year, every Roman citizen had to come and had to burn incense to those gods as a series, as a sense of allegiance to the gods. There is a story of Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the church leaders in Smyrna. He was arrested by Roman authorities and brought into the marketplace. And as he came there, the crowds chanted, here is the father of the Christians. Here is the father of the Christians. And the judge there that was judging him said, burn incense to Caesar. Burn incense to Caesar. Burn incense to Aphrodite. Burn incense to Dionysus. Burn incense to Demeter. And Polycarp refused. And one of the stenographers recorded the words of Polycarp and they went something like this. We have them in ancient literature today. I'm 86 years old, he says, an old man, deeply etched lines upon his face, gray hair, trembling hand. He said, I'm 86 years old and Christ has never wronged me yet. How can I deny my Jesus now? And Polycarp went and was burned at the stake. Those were terrible times, second century. But the worst, see, you had persecutions by Decian, Roman emperor. You had persecutions by Diocletian. Ten days, what's that mean? Often in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. You find that in Genesis 49. You find it in Numbers 4.6. You find it in... Uh, Numbers 1434. One, so 10 days could mean 10 years. If it does, which I believe it does, you go from 303 to 313 AD. They were the most fierce time of persecution during this period by Diocletian. Diocletian, the pagan Roman emperor, went beyond all of the past emperors in many, many ways. He outlawed Christianity in the empire. He passed a decree to stamp out and kill all Christians within the empire. So the persecution was fierce. There is a Roman historian by the name of Theoret, Theoret, and he talks about the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And he talks about Christian leaders coming to that council. Now remember, this 10 year persecution took place from 303 to 313. But in 325, you have this Christian council. And Theodoret writes, about some of these Christian leaders coming with their eyes plucked out because of the persecution. 
their arms cut off because of the persecution. Terrible flagellation because of the persecution. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say when you're facing persecution? What does Jesus say when you're facing trials and difficulties and heartaches and sorrow? Jesus says this back in our text. Jesus writes to the church, verse 10, do not fear any of the things which you are about to suffer. For indeed, the devil will throw you some into prison. You'll have tribu tribulation. But be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He says, don't fear. Because beyond the trial, beyond the difficulty, beyond the heartache, beyond the sorrow, beyond the tribulation, beyond the persecution, there is a crown of life. Now, the word for crown there is Stephanos. And Stephanos is not like a kingly crown, not that at all. Stephanos is the crown of the victor. When a person ran in an Olympic race and they were victorious in that Olympic race, they would get the garland, the crown. So Jesus says, you are in the race of life and you will get the victor's crown one day. Hang on. Look beyond the tears, look beyond the bloodshed, look beyond the disappointment, look beyond the sorrow. And if, you're walk, if you are participating with us today in this Bible study, and you're going through some real trials in your life, some real heartaches, look beyond all that to the crown of life. Now, Jesus says there, do not fear. I want you to turn back to 1 John chapter 4, because we need to turn, talk a little bit about fear. 1 John chapter 4. And here, our Lord talks to us about fear. And um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have a um, pen that you're writing some things down on. 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. You see verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So if perfect love casts out fear for the believer, what does it mean? You cannot cast out something that wasn't there presently, right? You can't cast out something that wasn't there. So fear is an emotion. There's nothing sinful about being fearful. All of us get fearful at times. So there's nothing sinful but it's when fear grips you. It's when fear strangles your joy. It's when you don't allow the love of Christ to overcome your fears. So what was Jesus saying to the church at Smyrna to you and me? He was saying, my children, at times of tribulation, you're gonna feel fearful at times, but concentrate on my love. Concentrate on how important you are to me, how precious you are to me. And my love will cast out that fear so it doesn't transform your life. So it doesn't grip you. We go back. Revelation chapter 2. Smyrna. Last verse. What does Jesus say to this church? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is the first death? It's the physical death that we all die unless Jesus comes. What is the second death? It's eternal death. So Jesus says to Smyrna, you are facing death. You're facing a time of great trial. But let my love cast out your fear because as you overcome and stay faithful to me, you will not be hurt by the second death, eternal death. So when cancer racks your body, when you are so old that you're shaking and trembling and you need hospice. When you are breathing your last from COVID, Jesus is saying, let my love fill your life. Let my love fill your life. And do not fear, because although you may go to sleep for a while, you'll not experience the second death. Smyrna. A church that faced persecution from 100 to 313. But that did not stop the onslaught of Christianity. Christians were making an impact on Roman society. One Roman writer wrote, you're everywhere. You're in our Senate. You're in our navies. You're in our army. You're in our marketplaces. You're everywhere. So what does Satan do? He has to do something else. So he brings in compromise. We go to the next church. Pergamos means exalted. 
Church, state, unite. Constantine, pagan Roman emperor, becomes a Christian. Church is exalted in the empire. This is the age of prosperity for the Christian church, but it's an age of compromise. It goes from about 313 AD to 538 AD. Now I should mention this. These dates are not hard and fast. Some Bible prophecies, many of them that we'll study, have a beginning date and an ending date. The Bible gives them to you. But in the seven churches, you have general periods. So sometimes you're going to read some flexibility in these dates. Don't get nervous about that because these are, are general time periods. They're not precise time periods. So to the angel of the church of Pergamos, Pergamos means exalted. These things I said to you has the sharp two-edged sword. What does a two-edged sword represent in the Bible? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I'll just quote it. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is sharp like a two-edged sword. So the two-edged sword is the word of God. So to a compromising church, the one who is the word judges that church that is compromised and drifted away from his word. These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works. Again, remember, everyone it starts with, I know your works. And you dwell where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and didn't deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. What does it mean here that, that uh, I know your works, you are dwell where Satan's throne is? So Pergamos was built on a hill. It rivaled Ephesus for um, domination in the Roman Empire. And uh, Pergamos had the altar to um, Augustus and also an altar, altar to Roma, who was a goddess. In Pergamos, you have the first time in history where a living Roman emperor was deified as God. Now, before, when the Roman emperors died, they could be deified. But in Pergamos, for the first time in history, they had this altar to Zeus, in which the Roman emperors, of course, worshipped and were, 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 were um, deified as gods. It's called the altar of Satan. Now, I've been to all these sites, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. I'll tell you a funny story about Pergamos. So we get to Pergamos. I was there with it as written. We were filming, taping a series on the seven churches. And we go to the ruins of the altar of Pergamos. Now, the Pergamum altar today has been reconstructed. The archaeologists have reconstructed it. It's in the uh, Pergamum Museum in, East Ber in Berlin. But anyway, so we're at the ruins of this Pergamos altar. And there's a fence all around it, this iron fence. It's ugly. And it says, don't climb over this fence. Uh, it's stay out, danger. So we were trying to take you know, a good shot, and the producer couldn't get it. And the producer looked at me, and he said, Mark, I really need you to be standing on the altar uh, of Zeus. So climb over that fence. I said, well, look at the sign on the fence. He said, Mark, that, that's not for us. Don't worry about it. Climb over the fence and get on that altar. And if anybody comes, you know, I'll, I'll take care of it. So I climb over the fence. I'm walking up. I get right on the middle of the altar of Zeus. The cameras are beginning to roll. And look, look, I step on a nest of vipers. These vipers must have been three to five feet. I mean, they were huge. At least they thought to be used to me. Diamond heads, green, hissing at me. I don't think I have been ever as scared in my life. And if I were in the Olympics running the 100-yard dash, I would have won. I jumped. I ran. I jumped over that fence. And the producer said, I didn't get the shot. Go back. I said, look, I'll run the camera. You go back. If I get killed, I'm not going down on the altar of Zeus. If I get killed, I don't want some big headline in the Adventist review saying, Pastor Mark Finley bit by a snake on the altar of Satan. If I die, I'm not dying on the altar of Satan, brother. So we settled for a picture in the front of the uh, fence. But I can guarantee you there is an altar of Satan, an altar of Zeus there. I stood on it, even if it were just for a few seconds before the snakes almost got me. So we go back to our text. I know your works, but where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, altar of Zeus. So here you have Christians, here you have believers that are dwelling in a city that is godless, where the emperor has declared himself to be God. And you hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith. What is this saying to you and me today? In the midst of a godless culture, this is what it's saying. Wherever you are, you can be faithful to Christ. Wherever you are, however difficult it may be, whatever pressure you face from a non-Christian husband or wife, 
whatever pressure you face in your work, you can be faithful to Christ. Notice, and did not deny my faith, even in the days as which Antipas was my faithful martyr and was killed among you where Satan dwells. What's this Antipas? Some people think it is a um, literal name. I don't. If you look at the word Antipas, anti in the Bible often doesn't mean against. It means another or in the place of. Pas means father, in the place of my father. There were Christians in Pergamos that the father passed down the faith to his son. Fathers passed down faith to their children. And those children stood firm for Christ in the face of martyrdom. Notice what it says. You did not deny my faith even in the days of which Antipas, one who stands in the place of his father, a son, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. There were those in the midst of that culture that had sons that stood for the faith that would never, never deny God's name. Then it says, but I have a few things against you because you've, you have, there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Remember Balaam, false prophet. And uh, what does Balaam do? Commits sexual immorality, violates the law of God, leads uh, the Israelites under Balak to uh, commit adultery with the Moabite women. So he totally disregards God's law. So what are we talking about in this period of time? We're talking from 313 to 538 AD. We're talking about a time of compromise. We're talking about a time when Christianity is diluted. We're talking about a time where pagan idols come into the church, where the sun worship comes into the church. We're talking about, but I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Balaam? The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of compromise. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine that says, whatever the culture around you is doing, meld paganism and Christianity with that. That's exactly what Constantine did. He made Christianity legal in his empire. He decided that to save the empire, he was willing to compromise and to unite Christianity and paganism. So the idols that the pagans worshiped came into the church during this period of time. The sun worship from paganism came into the church during this period of time. Uh, so the, there was a drift during this period of time from the word of God to the traditions of men. So this is the big Balaam principle, but we go on. It says, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block uh, before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols. So this is, you see, again, this is compromise to commit sexual immorality, violation of the law of God, compromise, that you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans. What is that? The doctrine of Nicolaitans is let your own mind be your guide. Don't be guided by the word of God. It's lawlessness. It's unbridled passion. It's do what you feel to be right, which thing I hate. Repent or I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What's the sword of his mouth? The word of God, the word of God. Then it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. In other words, what is the hidden manna? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. To him who is faithful, I will reveal myself and satisfy the inner longings of the heart, the inner longings of the soul. Go back, please, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The manna, of course, fell in the Old Testament, representing God's provision for humanity, God's provision for our physical needs, our spiritual needs, our emotional needs. John 6, and you're looking there at verse 31 to 34. John 6, verse 31 to 34. Jesus says, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I said to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. So the manna that fell in the wilderness provided for their physical nourishment, but that was not the true bread. What is the true bread? What's the true manna? 
Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as written, and he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you, verse 32, the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What is the true manna spoken of here? Jesus says, if you stand apart from the culture, if you stand apart from the false gods, if you refuse to compromise your faith, Jesus says to you, I will give you the hidden manna. I will give you myself. I will nourish your soul. You and I will walk together and talk together and fellowship together, Jesus says. Then look, and I, and I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. I will give to him what a white stone. What's the white stone? What's the white stone? In ancient times, when a person was tried and the jury returned, the foreman of that jury had two stones in his hand, a black stone and a white stone. If he drops the black stone, the person is guilty, condemned, often condemned to death. If he drops the white stone, the person is acquitted. What's a white stone? Jesus says, be faithful to me. I'll give you the hidden manna. I'll fill your life with my presence. And I'll give you the white stone. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You are forgiven. The condemnation is gone. The blood of Christ covers your sins. I'll give you the white stone. And I'll write a special name on it. Your name that only Jesus and you know. And on that stone, saved, redeemed, my child to live in heaven with me forever. The message of Ephesus, do not ever leave your first love. Keep that love burning brightly. Message of Smyrna, in trial be faithful unto death. The message of Pergamos, resist compromise at all costs. We must hurry to the message of Thyatira. We come to the last of our four churches for today, Thyatira. And we look there at verse 18, and Thyatira would represent the period of dark ages just before the beginning of the Reformation, from about 538 AD to about 1517. To the angel of Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God. Now, it's interesting. I want you to go back and look at the vision in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, when Christ is pictured in the midst of the seven lampstands, in verse 13, it says, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of who? Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet. So in Revelation chapter 1, when Christ walks among us, when he fellowships with us, when he holds us in his hand, when he ministers to our needs, he is the son of man. He is the one that walked the dusty streets of Galilee. He is the one that walked the cobblestone streets to Jerusalem. He is the one that was hungry, the one that was thirsty, the one that had no place to lay his head, was poverty stricken. He is the one, the son of man. He identifies with you. He identifies with me. But when he triumphs over the principalities and powers of hell, when he triumphs over all the forces of wickedness, he is the son of God. The son of God became the son of man. So sons of men could become sons of God. Jesus is fully divine. Jesus is fully human. And in the book of Revelation, we find Christ as the Son of God and the Son of Man. We continue here. These things, verse 18, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass. He is the Son of God. He says, I know your works. Remember, every time, same expression, I know your works. I know your works. Love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Interesting text, isn't it? The last are more than the first. In other words, there's improvement here. See, the dark ages go on, but as you come out of the dark ages, there is uh, the, there are the Waldenses, there's Huss and Jerome. There's, there's, so he's showing you that there's, there's improvement. We're coming out of the dark ages. There's, but then he goes back in. Nevertheless, 
I have a few things against you because you allow the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, eat things offered to idols. Remember in Bible prophecy, a pure, chaste woman represents the true church. A harlot woman represents the fallen church. When the church goes whoring after the world, it's called adultery. Keep your finger there. We're going to go to James chapter 4, verse 4, just to get this symbol clear. What does Jezebel represent? Jezebel represents everything that's false about religion, idol worship, sun worship, uh, disobedience to the laws of God, disobedience to the plan and purpose of God. James chapter 4, and you're looking there at James 4 and verse 4. James 4, verse 4, it says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So when you read about Jezebel and sexual immorality, you're reading about a corrupt church that is united with the world. You're reading about a political, ecclesiastical union. You're reading about a union of church and state during the Middle Ages that persecuted the people of God and introduced a corrupt form of Christianity. And then it says, indeed, I will cast her into the sickbed. In other words, she's spiritually sick. She has not taken the vitamin pills of God's word, the gospel, to change and transform her. It's a human form of religion. Indeed, I'll cast some of you in verse 22 into the sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless you repent of their deeds. Now, this is good, isn't it? Unless you repent of the deeds. Even in the deprivation, the corruption, even in the spiritual apostasy of Thyatira, there was still hope. Still hope that you could repent from your deeds. Whoever you are tonight, wherever you are, there is hope. Hope that you have not gone too far. Hope that you have not turned your back too greatly. The scripture says, repent of their deeds. There is hope. Now, verse 23 seems strange to some people if you look at it literally, not symbolically. I'll kill her children with death. What's it to, who are Jezebel's children? Jezebel's children are, are the followers of Jezebel who have also broken God's law. It's not speaking about children like infants. It's talking about descendants of, children of Jezebel. In other words, those who too are living lawless, godless lives will suffer the same fate as Jezebel namely eternal loss. What he says here, then he says, I will give each one according to your works. Interesting, before that, he says, I, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. God knows our heart. He looks beyond what we do to who we are. Verse 24, now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira. Isn't that good? The rest in Thyatira. There's an interesting expression there. It says the remnant in Thyatira. So Thyatira would have those within it who were faithful. What this tells me is this, in the midst of corruption, in the midst of darkness, we can be overcomers. Did you notice that each of these four, seven churches, the first four, and actually the last three too, all say he who overcomes. In Ephesus, when you left your first love, you can be an overcomer. In Smyrna, when you're facing tribulation and death, you can be an overcomer. In Pergamos, where there's compromise all around you, you can be an overcomer. In Thyatira, you can be an overcomer. Notice, as many as do not have, on verse 24, now to you, to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who've not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Here is the theme of the book of Revelation. Hang on. Don't give up because Jesus says, I am coming again. Hold fast till I come. Throughout the Bible, 1,500 places Jesus says, I'm coming again. We read it in Psalms where Jesus, through David, says, our God shall come and not keep silent. The seventh from Adam prophesies of the coming of Christ. 
Isaiah says, he will come, Isaiah 35. Paul says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Jesus says, I will come again. Here, it says, hold fast till I come. What is it that puts a smile on our face? What is it that puts a sparkle in our eyes? What is it that puts a spring in our step? What is it amidst tri tribulation, amidst spiritual apostasy and corruption? What is it that keeps us going? It is the promise of Jesus coming again. Now notice here though, it says, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He, that is Jesus, will rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also received from my father, and I'll give him the morning star. He was near, let him hear what the Spirit says to churches. The morning star, Jesus Christ, arises in our hearts and gives us the reality that Christ will smash down the powers of hell. See this expression, the rod of iron? It's mentioned three times in Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we're looking there at verse 5. Revelation 12, verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. One day, sin and sickness will be no more. One day, sorrow and suffering will be no more. One day, heartache and horror will be no more. One day, disease and disaster and death will be no more. And Jesus Christ will reign from east to west, from north to south, with a rod of iron. What is the rod of iron? A rod of iron, a rod is a symbol of authority. And the rod of iron, iron is unbreakable. The unbreakable authority of Christ will smash down the powers of hell. We read about the rod of iron in the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2. We read about the rod of iron in Revelation 12. And the Bible ends, and we read about the rod of iron in Revelation, the 19th chapter. Revelation chapter 19. And the Bible tells us here once again about Christ coming on a white horse. And notice, as Christ is coming, verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Here's the final conflict. Wickedness is destroyed. Sin and suffering are destroyed. His arms are like a fire, like a flame of fire. And on his head, many crowns. He had on his name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. It is the living Christ who's coming for us. The Christ that died for us. His name is called the word of God. The one that judges the world by his word. The armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. White's a symbol of victory. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he himself, he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. Three times in Revelation, the rod of iron. Revelation 3, Revelation 12, Revelation 19. What's it talking about? Wickedness will be smashed and destroyed. The nations that have opposed God will be obliterated. And from east to west, from north to south, Jesus, the living Christ, one day after that great millennial period, New Jerusalem will come down from heaven. And Jesus will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. And you and I can reign with him. Praise his holy name. I want to be with him on that day, don't you? I don't want to lose my first love. I don't want to give up in tribulation. I don't want to yield to compromise. And I certainly don't want to yield to the pressures of a culture around me, but be faithful to the word of God always. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you with all of our hearts for Jesus. How we thank you for these precious lessons in Revelation. Everything we study now prepares us for the latter chapters so that we can fully understand them in the light of the great controversy between good and evil. We thank you for that. Bring us back next week for another Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, two things before you go. First, if you have any questions, be sure to send them in, and I'll try to answer some of them at the beginning next time. That's info at hopelives365.com. Info at hopelives365.com. Do you know that we have 11,000, it's almost 12,000 now, people enrolled in this class. 12,000 people studying the book of Revelation together. 
please invite your friends. It's not too late to do that. Let's have uh, an explosion on the internet. Now, if you want the study guides, you do hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. That's hopelives365 forward slash weekly Bible study. And you will be able to get the study guides. We upload them after the class every time. So be sure to be praying about our class for next week. We'll look at the next last three churches in Revelation chapter three, the last of the seven churches. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Be praying on who God wants you to invite to the Bible study. Let's go from 12,000 upwards and upwards so that many thousands can hear the word of God. God bless you and good night.